positive investment. Uh, Deborah or Nessa, uh, would you like to add uh, any comment on this uh, issue? Sure, I would briefly um, basically bring it back to the basics. I mean, we get sometimes get, uh, we get caught up in the technical jargon and, and the nitty gritty of how machinery works. As far as I'm concerned personally, I see this as a battle of values. And this battle of values um, is very much about uh, a belief in individual rights whether an individual have the right to decide for themselves within, of course, the frame law, framework of the law when that law is just and fair, um, what to see and what to read and how to access it. That's on uh, one point. The second point is that, unfortunately, um, the discussion about social media, censorship, um, ultimately the Internet in the Middle East and North Africa issues a very important issue, which is uh, to what extent can IT technology be leveraged to raise and improve um, the economics of this region and ultimately the youth um, who um, in the Middle East and North Africa were the ones who made these revolutions for the simple demographic fact that they are the majority. For instance, there was um, you know startups uh, that, that came up, I believe Mektoub, um, uh, which was sold, acquired to Yahoo, um, Put the money aside. That's not really what is important. Uh, um, uh, entrepreneurship like Maktoub and Yemli by Habib Haddad, uh, these are demonstrate to that core youth in the Middle East and North Africa, and I'm including their Iran deliberately, because it belongs in that conversation, uh, even though that our focus here in the, is the Arab Spring. Demonstrate to them that there is indeed a way to innovate to create solutions, to excel, which is something that has not been available because this speaks to the core issue of individuality and citizenship because at the end of the day, what am I worth if my ideas remain locked in my head? That, isn't that the essence of censorship? That's my personal opinion. And if you want a good English language resource on the startup community, those of you with laptops open, Yalla Startup. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, sort of in terms of the way forward, I mean, there are three basic baskets. I mean, there are the opportunities that are presented here, there are the challenges that um, will be faced in the region and beyond, and then there is a resilience, which I want to make sure and mention. Um, certainly, just to focus on Tunisia for a minute, I mean, it has tremendous opportunities. Uh, I tend to um, emphasize uh, economic development. I know when I returned in May, when we returned with our report, and we're going to get May of 2005, we're going to go see all these agencies again. You know, I thought, what do I, what can I add to this? What do I bring? I have a you know, journalist colleague who's going with me and others. It was to really push the Tunisian government on the economic development opportunities for them. And given their current level of education, the current um, ICT uh, penetration in the economy and in the society, um, if you look across the Mediterranean, there's a huge market just waiting for them right across the Mediterranean. Uh, you know, that it could well be argued that their level of development exceeds that of Portugal. So they have really tremendous economic opportunities. You can draw parallels with Singapore that shows, and, and even with Korea, uh, and I did do this for them. Those countries had authoritarian regimes, um, you know, after uh, in the uh, late 20th century. That was the path they chose to development. That has been, we have to accept it, that has been a path of development that countries have used and, and have used successfully. But at a certain point, when a country like Korea or Singapore decides that for the future of its economic development, it has to build an information communications technology uh, manufacturing and services capability uh, and a base as part of their economic development, they are building in the seeds of democratization, whether they like it or not. And it may be 30 years on, or you know, they can try and suppress it as long as they want. And at a certain point, given that educated population, given the ICT and you know, if we like to call social media too now, uh, base, they have to uh, face the idea of loosening up a little bit, you know, allowing a little bit of opening for their people so as to leap their country to the next level of development. Now Tunisia has had you know, their, their spring, and so they have this opening now uh, to leap to that next level of development and take advantage of it, and so I urge them very much to do so. You know, in the case of Egypt, and I'm not going to go country by country, it's a very different um, picture 
you know, you have a much more poverty, you know, a much larger population, a different uh, mix of population. And so, you know, my own view was they needed to turn very fast in order to turn successfully. And I'm becoming very worried now because their movement is slowing and it, I think it's going to make it more difficult for them. Um, but Tunisia has a very heavy burden on itself because um, in terms of their economy, they have the human capacity and the other things I've mentioned. Um, they can also play a role model for the region and beyond. I mean, not only in the Arab Spring or in the uprising and how, you know, the to-do manual of that, how to do that, but then how to move beyond that to make a sustainable uh, economy and society. So you have, um, you know, the uh, role model of democratization. They have to be a role model for the role of women in the Arab world, absolutely. You know, this is a, it is possible to be a country that is Islamic and that women are educated, and that women participate in the workforce and in education. And so that's a very, very important role. And also, very importantly, it allows these countries, you know, in mo many, many uh, countries of the region, in Kuwait, women are more educated. Women and men in Kuwait have an average of a 12th grade education. That's higher than the average education level in the United States. And women are actually more educated than men in Kuwait. And that's true in a number of Arabic countries. Yeah. So again, the argument to them is 50% of your social <coughs> capital, you must unleash it for your own development. Uh, so there's the uh, role of women, and there's also the role of education. Um, uh, you mentioned the high youth population, and I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the, the Tunisia has an extremely high literacy rate and the highest in the Arab world. So again, I would give Tunisia the burden, I'm making a long list for you, of, you know, really um, being a beacon for that to promote education. Uh, there it was a, this is a rather old study now, maybe 10 years old, but the United Nations um, got together a group of um, Arabic scholars and um, some years ago, 10 years ago or so, and had them write a big report about, you know, why was development lagging in that region? Why, what were we seeing a higher level of development? And one of the key, a big thick report, but one of the key things to me from reading that big thick report was that they noted that the number of works translated into Arabic language in the previous 1,000 years equaled the number of books translated into Spanish in one year. So there was no osmosis happening between cultures and with the rest of the world. And so that is something that really needs to be set up massively. And obviously these kinds of tools we're talking about permit that sort of osmosis to take place much more vibrantly. What are the challenges? Okay, use ICT to build upon, that's not easy. I'm saying just do it. And as you're pointing out, it's not easy. It's not easy to turn the um, sunk capital already into something um, more uh, usable. Um, enhance uh, democratic participation, that's a challenge. Be a beacon to the um, Arab world and to North Africa. Tunisia actually has, and actually Ben Ali himself was very proud of um, noting this, Tunisia has the oldest human rights um, uh, organization on the African continent mm -hmm. in existence quite a long time. But they do play a role speaking out, you know, southerly into the rest of Africa. So there's an important role there. Another challenge for Tunisia and all of these countries, and a very, very significant challenge, and it hasn't been mentioned yet, are Islamists. Huge challenge. And if you look at traditional media, who had, you know, while Ben Ali was sitting on everyone else's head, who had a TV channel? It was the Islamists. So when you look at political organization and democratization and the emergence of uh, political voices and social voices, they already have a leg up. And so that's something to be watched very closely and monitored. I want to mention two examples of resilience, because there is a huge amount of resilience in this region, um, and they're the following. So the second time we went to Tunisia, again, I mentioned that people were often for doing minor things, jail. So someone had been jailed for a minor offense, and so uh, one of the lawyers uh, in Tunisia went to the prison to rep to offer to represent them, and he was dragged across the courtyard and thrown in prison too. So this is, had gone on again and again and again. So um, the entire bar went on strike. Now can you imagine all the lawyers in just Washington agreeing to go on strike? And not only did they go on strike, but they hold up in the Bar Association building in Tunis for a month. More than, a, by the time we got there, they'd been there for four weeks. So they learned we were in town and they invited us over. So we went over one day in support of them, 
And in Tunisia, you know, they don't wear wigs, but they wear the long black gowns with the white stock, you know, kind of a tie at the top. And so we arrive, and there's the beautiful, uh, you know, Belle Epoque with cream-looking courthouse. And across the street is this beautiful classical Arabic uh, architectural building, which is the Bar Association. The street is filled with riot buses and riot police and so forth. And we go in, and in there, in this building, in all the warrens of this old building and the courtyards and so forth, are literally, imagine this, try and visualize, hundreds and hundreds of um, Tunisian lawyers, men and women, who had been away from their families for three or four weeks to protest the treatment of these attorneys and to protest their inability to represent people who were incarcerated summarily. So it's an example of the incredible resilience. I'm going to give you another example that I find even more incredible. Uh, there's a group called, I mean, even the name itself is amazing. It's a group called the Women of the Maghreb. So the Maghreb is in North African, you know, North African countries. So there's women from Algeria and Tunisia and Libya and so forth. And they have a women's rights organization. So even the idea of having an organization like this in a place like that is, you know, beyond incredible. So they were holding their annual meeting. And so women, I mean, we were invited and we happened to be there one of the times when they were having their own. So women had snuck into Tunisia from Algeria and other places to go to this meeting of the women's rights organization of the Maghreb. And it was held in a private home in the living room. And when we arrived, of course, there were all the people leaning against the building across the street to survey who was coming and going and who was arriving. Miriam smiling. This is so true, right? Yeah, sure. And then we go in and this room is just, you know, packed with little seats in this living room, you know, with many, many, many people who had risked a lot to come and participate in the meeting of the women of the Maghreb. So these are just two examples of, I think, the incredible resilience that exists throughout these countries, you know, that we will need to rely on as we go forward. Thank you, Deborah. It seems that you will never forget your uh, the time you spent in Tunisia, but you you can also go now on holiday and it will help the the country because I would like to thank you also for reminding the the, the importance of um, innovation and uh, um, economic uh, development uh, for um, in order to have this uh, democratic uh, process uh, s uh, stabilized. We should never forget that these revolutions started uh, before, even before the claim for uh, freedom, uh, they started uh, by the claim for dignity and the claim for, for employment. So um, this, is, uh, this is very important. The only problem is that this takes time and we don't have time. Uh, we do have some time um, in the session to, uh, to to open the floor for, for questions, so be ready for your questions and, and comments. But I would like to um, make a, a comment myself. This conference is uh, very much concerned with uh, privacy. And um, I'm, uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and I'm following quite closely uh, what is said uh, by internet, uh, at least internet users, uh, which are the elite uh, in, in, in Tunisia. And uh, I'm a bit desperate to, to see that um, they are very much concerned with freedom of expression, uh, end of censorship, but I never see any concern on privacy. And this is a big issue, and uh, I see my friend Mark Kotenberg, and I can tell you that there is a lot of work that we should do uh, in, uh, in Tunisia, and I hope all the, the, the NGOs of this community would uh, help uh, for 